There's something strange happening in the small town of Santa Mira, California. There are reports of a contagious delusion of people who claim their own dear family members are not who they appear to be, that they have been replaced by imposters. One man, a Dr. Miles Bennell, was found assaulting cars on the freeway outside of town, telling a mad tale of an invasion from the stars by malicious seed pods that give birth to nearly perfect copies of human beings. In the mid-1950s, Hollywood producer Walter Wanger set about making a film version of Jack Finney's recent serialized novel, The Body Snatchers. With a script written by Daniel Mainwaring, Wanger brought on Don Siegel to direct. Due to studio pressure, the film had to be done on a very tight budget of only $350,000 and a scant 20 days for principal photography. Under such constraints, Wanger and Siegel were forced to hire virtual unknowns in the lead roles. Kevin McCarthy played protagonist Dr. Bennell, and Dana Winter played the primary love interest, Becky Driscoll. Because of studio-mandated reshoots and other complications, the final budget of the film came closer to $400,000 and took 23 days to film. Several ambitious ideas had to be discarded, including a voiceover narration that Wanger tried to hire the legendary Orson Welles, or famed science fiction author Ray Bradbury, to deliver. Wanger and Siegel fought with the studio over the final cut of the film, but ultimately it was released in Super Scope format in February of 1956 and made over a million dollars in its first month despite film critics basically ignoring it. Many theaters promoted the release with paper mache seed pods and life-size posters of the actors. Let's make one thing very clear. Invasion of the Body Snatchers is, contrary to popular belief, not about communism. Jack Finney, the writer of the Body Snatchers novel, vehemently and repeatedly denied having any political message to his story, and the filmmakers behind the 1956 film are just as strong in their denials. The book and film are about a man and a woman finding the ability to trust and love other people after suffering through their own separate divorces. The movie expands on the novel's core theme by turning it into a credo for never letting the difficult trials of life force you into abandoning, quote, love, desire, ambition, and faith." Unquote. The villainous pod people, who are stand-ins for people who have given up, argue that love never lasts, and they urge Miles to abandon his dreams and embrace his more cynical and nihilistic impulses. The story, therefore, is about being given a choice to either pursue your dreams or descend into fatalism. Given the politics of the 1950s, it's easy to see how this idea can be misinterpreted as a point about the individualism of capitalism versus the somber conformity of communism, but such an interpretation is, to put it bluntly, just plain wrong. Failing to understand this is one of the primary reasons its more recent remakes fail. 2007's The Invasion, for example, bogs down the personal stakes with heaps of meandering political messaging that clouds the emotional impact of the underlying horror. When characters are more concerned with espousing beliefs about the pharmaceutical industry, discussing the perils of disingenuous international diplomacy, and twirling their mustaches in corporate boardrooms than in having actual character development, the political baggage vastly outweighs any human connection the audience can make with them. 2007's The Invasion is therefore less frightening, because there is no compelling emotional reason for Dr. Bennell, a woman in this version, to let go of her humanity. She is still a divorcee, but unlike the original Dr. Bennell, she doesn't seem to be too tormented by this, nor does she let it define her character. Instead, she is given a son she loves with all the selflessness a good mother should, and so she isn't even remotely tempted to give in. 1956's Dr. Bennell, on the other hand, is clearly a more vulnerable character. Sure, he hides his pain under a veneer of self-deprecating humor and sly charm, but he is not an emotionally healthy man, as evidenced by his stated attitudes towards love and marriage early in the film. It is only through Becky Driscoll, herself another wounded divorcee, that he finds the ability to open himself up again, to find a reason not to succumb to the pods, and that is a connection he finds throughout the course of the story. Granted, there is a pretty significant difference between the novel and the 1956 film when it comes to Dr. Burnell's relationship to Miss Driscoll. In the book, they both escape unscathed and their determination to fight to the end is strong enough to convince the pods to abandon Earth and try their invasion elsewhere. While this ending is cheap, it does fall in line with the uplifting point Jack Finney was trying to make. Of course, in the movie, things don't turn out so well, with Becky getting body snatched at the climax and leaving Dr. Bunnell alone to rail like a madman at the traffic on a California freeway. This subverts Finney's story, but in so doing, it makes it a far more powerful example of horror. 
I happen to think it makes for a much better ending, as proven once again by the more recent remakes that tried to have happier endings. The original cut of the film ended there, with Miles screaming, You're next, directly into the camera. The final cut's book ends with Miles telling the story and convincing the military to go into Santa Mira to stop the invasion was shot afterwards, at the insistence of a studio that refused to let the film end on such a dour note. Interestingly enough, test audiences seemed to like the bleaker ending, but the major Hollywood studios of the 1950s were rarely ever daring enough to let something like that slip through. This is not to say all the studio interference was necessarily a bad thing. They also insisted on several cuts to tone down the humor, which was apparently much more rampant in the original cut. Perhaps this was done to offset the brutal ending, but the studio felt it made the tone too inconsistent. Test audiences actually agreed on this too. Though the original cut is lost to time, it's hard to imagine how more humor could work in this film, seeing as how what humor is there, mostly Miles making nervous jokes to mask his emotion, is more than enough. Any more would probably feel out of place, given the harrowing stakes of the story. In 1994, the United States National Film Registry selected 1956's Invasion of the Body Snatchers for inclusion in the Library of Congress for being, quote, culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant, unquote. It is considered today to be one of the greatest science fiction films ever made, landing a spot in the top ten by the American Film Institute. Its influence is profound, and though it is often overshadowed by its 1978 remake, which will be the subject of my next video review, it cannot be brushed aside. And that's all for today, fellow Earthlings. If you like what I'm doing here, please let me know in the comments, after giving this video a like and subscribing to the channel, of course. For more on my opinions of Jack Finney's novel and the four, yes, four film adaptations, you can find written reviews for all of them on my website at emcgill.com. I'll put links in the description. As I said, I do intend to cover the 1978 version next, so be on the lookout for that. Until then, this is the Unapologetic Geek, telling you to never be ashamed of what you love, as long as you're not hurting anyone. Having fun?